What's up internet, it's your soul, and I'm going to go down a walk through history's dark corridors in this video and actually listen to a speaker who himself is uh, actually part of our history now, it's quite an old video that we're going to look through, but he himself is actually commenting on events from World War II and uh, you know that kind of period, and he's Dr. Anthony Sutton, who wrote a series of books, uh, one of the most famous ones, uh, was all about the rise of Hitler and how he was funded by certain individuals on Wall Street in America. And ultimately he's put together a lot of research, um, academic level research, into um, deep analysis of the documents and source evidence and so on, relating to the way that various entities in America and around the world, specifically America, have uh, for decades been funding some of the most um, tyrannical evil groups on the planet uh, and entire nations basically who they then uh, participated to some extent in having a war with so in other words America's opponents whether it be Germany in World War II Russia Vietnam and so on and in fact uh, in more recent times there's lots of evidence that they've also been doing this with ISIS and so on somehow some way certain elements high up in the American military and government seem to be always involved with um, profiting from war and deliberately causing wars only purely for profit. So it's not so often nowadays that we hear an academic uh, who's free and open enough with their words to actually address these topics in a professional way. So we have to look to generations gone past, unfortunately. So this is why I want to play this video. And I'm, it's mostly, it's quite a long video, it's 40 minutes maybe, and this isn't even the full thing I think, but it's a massive subject. And I'm just going to let most of it play and then occasionally drop my comments in. So uh, let's check it out. Dr. Sutton, you wrote three series of books while you were a research fellow at the Hoover Institute. Can you give me basically the background, the content of these series? Yes, the, uh, the uh, series I wrote at the Hoover Institution, Stanford University, concerned the transfers of Western technology to the Soviet Union. And essentially it comprised uh, three individual books. Each book covers a period of time from, since 1917. And then you wrote a second series of books on Wall Street. Yes, uh, these were trade books. Uh, in other words, they're, they're not academic books. They're written for the general public. Uh, they concerned the uh, build-up of the three types of socialism, uh, Bolshevik socialism in Russia, um, what we might call welfare socialism in the United States, and uh, Hitlerian or national socialism. And each book examines the financing and the contributions made by Wall Street by international bankers to, that, to the development of that specific form of socialism. Now, in your research and analysis and your efforts to bring... So, first of all, we've got this connection between the, let's say, heads of capitalism in the West and the financing of socialism. Now, obviously... That's the concept that the average person will find bizarre because they've been told that socialism and capitalism are complete opposites and one is always in conflict with the other. However, as I've been saying for a very long time, um, thanks to people like uh, Dr. Sutton and other people who have done good work exposing this, there is quite a, there's quite good evidence and lots of good reasons to tie together these two apparently opposite poles of... Um, approaches to economics and government let's say because ultimately the capitalist side of things can always profit from the socialist side of things and <laughs> we'll see a bit more about how that is but it's just something to bear in mind here that that is kind of where a lot of this is going um, but he does have good evidence to back that up out the facts about what was going on in our society did you encounter any effort to discourage you to prevent you from bringing out the background of america's involvement in the financing of international communism yes very definitely um, for example uh, when i was at the Hoover institution uh, in 1972 i went to miami beach to give some testimony before the um, republican national committee and uh, although a congressman had hand-delivered to the wire services this testimony, which was later printed, uh, the wire services refused to transmit it to the newspapers. Then when I got back to the Hoover Institution um, in California, um, I was called into the office of the director, and 
I was uh, told in no uncertain terms not to make any more speeches like that and that this information should not be made public. This was the information that we were giving the Soviet Union the technology to develop its war potential? Oh, yes. At that time, we were, in, we were in Vietnam. And as you know, the Soviets were supplying the North Vietnamese. This was 1972? 1972, yes. And, uh, for example, I knew that the Gorky plant, which was built by the Ford Motor Company, but the Gorky plant in Russia produces the gas a series of vehicles. The gas vehicles had been seen on Ho Chi Minh's trail. We were supplying equipment to the Gorky plant in the middle of the Vietnamese war, and these trucks were being used to carry ammunition supplies, which were killing Americans. Now, I thought this was morally wrong, and I said so at Miami Beach and at the Hoover Institution. And it was this type of information uh, that was suppressed. And so what eventually happened as far as your activities at the Hoover Institution were concerned? Well, I didn't pay much heed to the warnings. I, I published a book called National Suicide in the following year, which um, summarized our assistance to um, the Soviets, our military assistance to the Soviets. And when that book came out, the brain, again, there was great pressure to stop the book. Uh, both on, there was pressure on both the publishers and me personally. And uh, I felt I couldn't take this. And a few years later, I just left the Hoover Institution. And since 1975, I've been an independent author without any ties whatsoever. Okay, so pretty interesting uh, similarities there between the modern world and what he's describing. I don't think there's many people who really know this fact or data regarding um, the way that the Ford Motor Company was involved in producing uh, weapons grade vehicles in Russia that were then sent through to the Vietnamese and were used to fight Americans. In fact, the Ford Motor Company was involved, um, I believe it was Ford from memory, may have been one of the other similar American big companies pretty sure as Ford, uh, were involved in also supplying parts that were used in the German tanks in World War II as well. So you've basically got an American, one of the world's best known American corporations, held up as a kind of American hero by many people, Henry Ford and his company, uh, actually directly providing the means for America's opponents to kill Americans. At the time it was happening, continuing to do it. So... Draw your own conclusions from that, but it gets gets a lot deeper. Let's go a little bit into the background of the financing of the German war machine that we fought in the period 1941 to 1945. Could we start, first of all, with the original financing of Hitler between 1922 and 1923, uh, 1923 when he was first making his effort to come into prominence in Germany? The, uh, Original financing of Hitler, that's in the years 1922, came only partly from Germany. Uh, one of the most prominent Americans concerned with financing Hitler was uh, Henry Ford. In fact, Henry Ford received a medal in 1938 for his assistance to the early Nazi party. Then, of course, Hitler had his attempted push in uh, 1923. He went to jail, and then we begin another era in the rise of Hitler. Right, and of course he eventually came to power in 1933 uh, by the electoral process. What about the financing of Hitler's um, electoral activities in 1933? But this, this I can trace, I have traced it very exactly. I discovered uh, amongst the Nuremberg records a series of bank transfer slips um, to the Delbruck Schickler Bank in Berlin to an account which was under the control of Rudolf Hess. And this was the fund that was used to finance Hitler's access to power in March 1973. And amongst the corporations that transferred money to Hitler, I find not only R.G. Farben, which is, which is quite widely known, but also uh, German General Electric, AEG, which is under, under the control of General Electric in the United States, or was at that time, and com uh, companies like Osram and... Um, now, what was the time between Osram and General Electric? The tie-in was a share tie-in. International General Electric in the United States had controlling interest in German General Electric and also through share interlocks, uh, a controlling interest in Osram in, in Germany. So then we have Ford and we have General Electric helping to finance Adolf Hitler's mm -hmm. rise to power. Were mm -hmm. any other large American corporations involved? Oh, very definitely. Um, Standard Oil, through its uh, technical association with IG Farben, um, uh, for example, uh, Germany could not have gone to war in 1939 
without uh, tetraethyl. You need tetraethyl to raise the octane value of aviation gasoline. Germany had no means of doing that. This was developed in the um, in the ethyl uh, laboratories in the United States and transferred uh, to the Germans. Uh, Standard Oil came up with the hydrogenation idea, which was very essential for Germany in the 1930s because the, uh, to raise the quality of its gasoline for aviation purposes. This was transferred to the Nazis. And uh, ITT, for example, International Telephone and Telegraph, uh, was very intimately associated with the Nazis uh, through Dr. Schroeder, who was head of the um, ITT subsidiaries in uh, Germany. And ITT controlled companies which made not only um, um, electrical instruments, but also the Focke-Wulf plant, which made um, airplanes, uh, fighter airplanes. So what you're suggesting then is that American corporations were helping to finance the German industry that was building up the war potential? American corporations, only a few, not many, financed Hitler through their subsidiaries. They transferred technology. They transferred material assistance, for example, stocks of tetraethyl before the Germans could manufacture it under the joint manufacturing agreement with the United States. And also they financed this. For example, Standard Oil financed in 1933 the development of the um, gasoline industry in uh, Germany, which was needed to fight World War II. And that's a very interesting point. Could you go a little bit into the background of where Germany got its oil to fight the Second World War? Because certainly Germany doesn't have oil resources. Germany does not have oil resources, that's true. It uh, used in World War II synthetic oil, which it did, which it uh, got from coal and the basic technical processes for the development of oil from coal came from the United States from uh, essentially from the standard oil laboratories which had this technical assistance agreement with IG Farben and of course IG Farben contributed uh, something like 60 percent of the explosives needed um, by the German Wehrmacht uh, probably about 40 50 percent of the gasoline needed by the Wehrmacht and by the German Air Force the Luftwaffe and was there a definite interlock between IG Farben and Standard Oil? The uh, interlock was at the technical level, the exchange of patents. It was through a financial technical assistance agreement. There were other interlocks with the United States uh, through a subsidiary IG Farben um, in the United States. But with Standard Oil, the interlocks at the technical and financial level. And is it a fact it's been stated that there were members of the board of directors of Standard Oil who were also on the board of directors of American IG Farben? Yes, uh, Walter Teagle is one name that comes to mind. Yeah. Well, there were several, there were several directors. Was there an interlock with Ford between IG Farben and uh, American IG Farben and the Ford Motor Company? Um, not that I can recall, not offhand. Not offhand. So basically what we're seeing then is American industry helping to provide the technology, helping to provide the finance, helping to provide the material that is going to allow Hitler to create his war machine. Yes, that is correct. That is correct. Now, in your book, Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, you talked about the bombing patterns during the Second World War. And the fact that it was amazing that there were certain factories that were not bombed, whereas the majority of the German factories were decimated, German-owned factories, there were certain factories that tied into this interlock we've already alluded to mm -hmm. that, for some strange reason, seemed to escape the devastation of our saturation bombing. In, in World War II, the uh, German uh, electrical industry was or should have been a prime target for Western bombing. But in practice... Uh, the German General Electric plants were not bombed. Uh, of the ten major plants, not one was bombed, and a half a dozen others had trifling damage, broken windows, that kind of thing. So what we have here is a very interesting case of an industry which should have been bombed in World War II, but was not bombed, and yet we have a market ownership which raises a certain amount of suspicion as to why it was not bombed. Okay, so a lot of information there. 
ultimately, obviously, it's talking about a situation where powerful elements within the American government um, and their connection to capitalist industry and corporations and so on, ultimately were able to sway the direction of events during the war in uh, World War Two, regarding who was bombed, who wasn't. Uh, and it would seem that it basically comes down to them having financial interest in certain elements not being bombed. So you have to ask the question, aside from the evil of the war in the first place and the fact that it probably didn't need to happen, well, obviously it didn't need to happen, it probably could have been avoided uh, in numerous different ways, but aside from all of that, think of how many people who thought they were being backed up from the American government by the American government who went over to fight in Germany basically died because elements within the American military and government were directing the military aggression away from their own uh, assets in Germany. So, in other words, those factories were able to continue producing armaments for Germany that were then able to continue going on killing Americans and British and all other people that were fighting against the Germans, uh, basically out of, for no other reason other than apparently the greed of the people who owned uh, financial interests there. So given that they were able to do that, that literally means people within the government were responsible for that. So we're basically proving here that America has a history of having had um, significant parts of its history directed by people who place their own financial success over the lives of any number, potentially a large number of American citizens and soldiers. Uh, regardless of the racial background, regardless of anything at all. It's not necessarily an issue of race or discrimination or anything like that, which America has also been plagued by. <clears throat> In this case, we're seeing a pure example of um, certain elements being more than happy to see numbers of Americans killed, just basically for their own financial gain. So that really raises the question, well, are those people really on the side of America? Are they on any side? Are they basically just like vampires trying to extort as much energy and power as they can from everyone else? Do they care who wins? Do they care at all? Do they, but are they, are they, I mean, that we have lots of evidence of, of uh, certain cults and free, secret societies operating, uh, skull and bones out of Yale and obviously Freemasons and so on, often tied in with very dubious uh, activities and rituals and so on. You can watch Alex Jones' video from Bohemian Grove uh, to see some aspects of that which are rarely seen. So is it possible that their motivation isn't even money? Is it basically that their motivation is just basically to have lots of people get killed um, so that it weakens as many people on the planet as possible, causes as much trauma as possible, which reinforces their position at the top of a pyramid because ultimately the weaker everyone else is, the more power they have, or relatively speaking, and the easier it is for them to control other people. Personally, I think that's what is happening, um, but this is fairly good evidence of something along those lines, I would say. But as far as the German-owned electrical companies, did they um, undergo a rather heavy bombing? I took a look at that. The Siemens plant, for example, uh, they were bombed. There's no question. But uh, the industry was not targeted as a general target. So Siemens, for example, was not bombed as heavily as, say, um, uh, tank plants or uh, aviation plants, that kind of thing. You mentioned the Ford plant in Cologne. Was this a prime military target? The Ford plant in Cologne should have been a prime military target. For example, the British Air Force, the Royal Air Force, did bomb the Ford plant at Poissy in France. But the Ford plant in Cologne, which was the by far the largest Ford plant in Germany, was not bombed in World War II. But did our military planners intend to bomb it? In other words, was it on the aiming report? Well, uh, I did look at the aiming reports for the, uh, the plants in Cologne. Uh, Ford was known about. Uh, they knew that it was producing equipment for the Wehrmacht. Uh, but it was not bombed. It was scheduled as a target, but it was not bombed. So somewhere along the line, as far as the planning was concerned, the name of uh, the Ford Motor Plant in Cologne was deleted, and yet the city of Cologne itself was totally decimated. The city of Cologne was decimated, uh, as of course many other cities in Germany were decimated. But somewhere along the line, um, something happened. I suspect it was in the aiming committees, and Without question, orders were sent out not to bomb uh, certain targets, even though these were prime military targets. And 
That's rather reminiscent of some of the orders that went out during the Korean War, some of the orders that went out during the Vietnamese War to leave specific targets within the enemy's domain untouched by our strategic bombing. I understand that was so, although I've not investigated it. Now, in your book, Wall Street and the Rise of Hitler, there was one very interesting section about a special fund that Heinrich Himmler had and the funneling of money from German corporations into this fund even up into the years 1943 and 1944 and many of these corporations had strong ties into the American corporations, into their, the American parent corporations. Could you tell us a little bit about the Kepler Fund? The Kepler Fund was also known as the Conto S Fund. It was uh, what we might call Heinrich Kimmler's personal slush fund. He used it for his own personal projects. And um, what amazed me was both in 1933 and in 1944, the two days, uh, the, the two years for which I examined the records, um, over half the funds came from American corporations. For example, in 1933, ITT, uh, Standard Oil, General Electric, and uh, and possibly Osram were contributors. Even in 1944, in the middle of World War II, we find that ITT was funneling funds to Heinrich Himmler's fund, uh, Heinrich Himmler's fund through um, Schroeder, who was the chairman of the. Uh, ITT subsidiaries in Germany. We also find that uh, DEPAG, the um, standard oil subsidiary in uh, Germany, was financing Heinrich Himmler, and this was in the middle of World War II. Now, were these facts ever brought out at the Nuremberg hearings? They were never brought out at the Nuremberg hearings, although the documents do exist within the uh, within the files, within the records. They have not been published, as far as I know. And you actually had access to these records? Yes, there's some 400 tons of these records available. And uh, many of them were at the Hoover Institution, or copies were at the Hoover Institution, and that's where I found the original documentation. I think it's a tragic part of our history when the American public doesn't realize the interplay then between great American corporations and the financing, the funding of the Nazi movement. Now, so this brings up so many different um, topics, and one thing that comes to mind is when you've got 400 tons of records relating to World War II in the uh, annals of history regarding the Nuremberg hearings of the uh, war criminals and so on at the end of World War II, 400 tons of documents, that's obviously a ridiculously large amount of documents. No one person is likely to have looked through them. And I have actually read other books which talk about the more occult aspects of World War II and the Nazi movement and the things that, was going, th things that were going on behind the scenes and some of their belief systems and rituals they were carrying out. And it's, it's claimed in there that some of those things were brought forward briefly in some of the Nuremberg court hearings and they were laughed out of court and people thought it was too ridiculous. Uh, and so they just weren't ever really looked into properly in those hearings. And yet there's quite a lot of evidence that shows that actually that kind of thing was going on uh, within the SS and, and other, um, let's say, less well understood factions within the Nazi party. So bearing all of that in mind, he's talking here about, you know, details regarding what went on uh, with the American funding uh, of, of Nazi Germany and so on, and how this evidence was actually present in those documents, but never really um had any kind of involved um had any effect during the trials imagine what else was in those documents that almost no one knows about because we haven't really had a chance well collectively uh you know we don't for example have all these documents digitized so that the whole world can do a deep dive into them like we might do today imagine what's in them so you know i think it would be a great service to humanity for whoever has the means to do so to actually um, get these documents all digitized so that the world can actually do that. I think that would be amazing. I wanted to talk just a little bit about the Nuremberg trials because at the Nuremberg trials, the Nazis, the Nazi war criminals, the Nazi generals were, hold, were held specifically guilty for what transpired. Were there any Americans um, involved or any Americans um, indicted were any Americans convicted as far as the financing of the Nazi war movement? Uh, very definitely not. Uh, I looked at the criteria for um, what we might call war, war crimes under the Nuremberg uh, Tribunal and there's no question in my mind that certain Americans well fitted the criteria 
which required indictment and trial. But no Americans were ever brought to trial. Do you think there was any conscious effort to conceal this fact, both from the Nuremberg War Tribunal and from the American public? Well, there was a conscious effort in the fact that uh, these businessmen were very uh, prominent in uh, stating in 1946 that they had no knowledge of what Hitler was doing, and yet they were intimately involved with the build-up with Hitler. I suspect that this was not published in the media at the time, although I've not checked that. But certainly the, the role of American corporations and American businessmen in aiding Hitler has not been published. Now what about the actual financing? What about the loans from large American banks, from large British banks, to Hitler's government in that period between 1933 and 1939 when Hitler was preparing for war? Well, you've got to go back a little earlier and look at what are known as the uh, young loans, which were very important because I think they brought about the economic collapse of Germany in 1933. That was the Young plan. But this was Owen Young, who was, of course, chairman of General Electric. Uh, here, we, here we got a man who actually made the loans as an officer of the United States government, which brought about the collapse of Germany in 1933, enabling Hitler to take over. And then subsequent to 1933, you get a series of loans. Um, a very good one is Standard Oil, which um, loaned several million dollars, at least, to Germany to build up its um, aviation gasoline facilities. And uh, there are other examples. Fine. Well, I'd like to get a little bit into the background of the financing of Bolshevism, because I think this is vitally important. And we can go back to the period after the Second Revolution, which was in October and November of 1917. The initial... So I just want to add in here, if we think about, for example, John Perkins, uh, video and book, movie, uh, Apologies of an Economic Hitman, where he reveals that in his career as part of, I believe it was the CIA, his job was basically to go around threatening leaders of different countries, primarily South and Central America, um, to let them know that basically if they didn't go along with America's plans for that area, then they'd be killed or other terrible things would happen to them. So generally they would uh, go along with that, and that's why you see so many, uh, let's say, revolutionary leaders of South America suddenly not being quite so revolutionary. So uh, he's been very outspoken on that, he's gone into graphic detail about it, and I would say it does, to me, it looks true. I've never heard anybody debunk what he's saying. Um, so, you're basically, th this information came out obviously after Anthony Sutton's interview here, so with the benefit of hindsight, we can say, well, you know, if America was, in more recent times, has been found to um, go in and corrupt and break down political systems in countries which have, let's say, a, a, an agenda which is a bit different to the standard capitalist American model, if they're as a matter of normality going in and corrupting them and causing them to collapse is not really beyond the and often by the way they do that via big loans and so on so they'll i mean it could be nowadays it tends to be done via the world bank and so on but ultimately we're talking about com countries being collapsed through the receiving of huge loans which they can't pay back um and you know i'm not an expert on the economics of pre-world war ii germany but as i understand it that's a very similar thing to what he's talking about here and obviously he's pointing the finger at American oil corporations and other corporations for having done that. And, you know, you can say, well, the, them having made these loans isn't a guarantee that they're trying to start a war. And no, it isn't. But it is very interesting that who is it that's going to profit the most, let's say, from a massive oil fueled war? Um, well, probably some of the oil corporations. So... Uh, you know, <laughs> fighting over oil and providing oil is something that's inherently connected to war as long as the vehicles of war use oil, isn't it? So we have to look very carefully at who's running the oil industry and, you know, who they've got ties to in the government, particularly in America. And when we do that, we start to see more pieces of the puzzle fall into place. So he's now talking about Russia, and this is equally interesting. And, you know, there's so much data and so much stuff being said about uh, Cold War relations between America and Russia and communism and capitalism and stuff. I think anybody who has ever argued for or against capitalism or communism needs to listen to what he has to say here. Financing of Lenin's movement. How did it tie into the American corporations? 
Was there any American involvement in that period between 1917 and 1918 when Bolshevism was just beginning to get a foothold in Russia? Yes, there were several uh, incidents. The most important is one involving Colonel uh, William Boyce Thompson, who was the largest shareholder in the Chase Bank, which of course today is Chase Manhattan Bank. And um, I published in one of my books a, uh, a copy of a cablegram which transferred funds from New York to Petrograd in December 1917, one million dollars to be precise. And uh, Colonel Thompson made the statement later that this one million dollars was given to the Bolsheviks uh, to, to consolidate. They, they had just begun to take over Russia. They only controlled Moscow and Petrograd at that time to aid the, um, the control that the Bolsheviks were extending in Russia. This is a very clear case. One million dollars, American funds, transferred through an American Wall Street intermediary to the Bolsheviks. And didn't you publish that uh, document here in Wall Street and the Rise of Bolshevism? I published two, uh, two statements. One is a copy of the cablegram, and the other is a copy of the news clip of the statement made by Colonel Thompson at that time that he had given, made this contribution. Now, why would an American capitalist, an American financier, help to aid Bolshevism? The only answer, and of course this puzzled me for years, you know, why, why? Because we understand there's been opposition. And the only answer I can come to is one of captive markets. The United States did not want another United States in the world. And of course, if you look at the world map, uh, Russia is uh, two or three times larger in the United States. Imagine this as another United States, as another competitor to the United States. What the United States wanted, or Wall Street wanted, was a captive market. And of course, socialism is a captive market because my earlier studies at Stanford University have brought out the fact that a socialist system cannot innovate. It's got to import innovation and technology from the West. And so I think the aim behind this was to encourage the development of Marxism and other, social, other types of socialism because this would give these Wall Street bankers control of a world market, a captive market. At the end of the First World War, Russia was devastated. So, yeah, very interesting angle on that there. Literally saying that the alleged capitalist ideal of having strong competition producing the best results doesn't really work if you intend to dominate everyone else, which obviously is, you know, I mean, if you're talking about competition, then your aim is to win, isn't it? But what, <laughs> it depends. Well, this is the interesting thing. You could say you're normally in competition, your, your aim is to win. Some people, proponents of capitalism say that, you know, there's this weird sort of equation going on where they'll say, on the one hand, the aim of it is to have competition to produce the best products and the best person or, or company wins. On the other hand, it's kind of like, well, if you're competing, then, you know, one of the ways that you can achieve winning is by your opponents just being hobbled or held back in some way. So if you're able to actually convince them to weaken themselves in some way, um, then you win by default. And there's nothing inherent within capitalism that stops you doing that, is there? Uh, I mean, in the sense of if you take competition to its ultimate extreme to um, and apply it to like the marketplace of ideas let's say you could say well it's okay for one country to be capitalist and one for be to be communist because then we'll see which is better and the one that's better will win out but if your team let's say uh is determined to win no matter what then it might be in your interest to weaken your opponent's team by getting them to um adopt a, a process or a way of being that you know to be um, damaging to them, which is basically what he's saying here. You know, in a sense, he's saying elements at the top of the pyramids in America wanted to weaken Russia as much as possible, so they, you know, empowered communism and socialism there and intended to then profit out of them as much as possible. I think that's a, a slightly debatable argument, but it is a valid one. I can see, you know, how that makes sense. And I definitely can see how even if his exact interpretation of it isn't exactly what happened i can still definitely see numerous other reasons why uh wall street bankers and so on would be interested in um creating that force uh i mean other people i it might even be um dr sutton i'm not sure i think maybe i'm thinking of another author but i've also read it said that um Basically, Germany was empowered by the Wall Street bankers in order to provide a defence to the European aristocrats 
from uh, the Russians or against the Russians, the Bolsheviks who had literally executed the Tsar and aristocracy of Russia. So there's different angles you can take on this, but ultimately, you know, it, it could be just simply a case of one bunch of rich people decided to play a power game involving the death of millions of people in order to become super uber rich and another group became threatened by that and then tried to sort of manipulate another group, Hitler and so on, to defend themselves or you know there's all kind of variations on that but this isn't just some theory that is you know laughable and uh just being dreamt up for the sake of it this is actually all based on source documents and things that weren't available at the time but which have come out since then uh through the diligent work of uh, historians and academics so uh you know i don't think it's wise to pass judgment on this or try to reach any conclusions unless you yourself have actually dug into this a bit more deeply than um, probably 99% of the population has. By famine. And America sent a relief mission. It was the Hoover mission. Do you know any of the facts surrounding the uh, activities of the Hoover Commission? Well, there's no question that in 1922, 1923, uh, Russia was finished. Uh, industrial output was perhaps uh, 8 or 10 percent of uh, 1913 figures and people were starving by the hundreds of thousands and the Hoover mission was organized of course to send aid uh, to Russia uh, but most of the aid went to the Bolsheviks who controlled uh, really quite a small part of Russia at that time only a very small part of the aid went to uh, the white Russians or to the Far East and then after 1922-1923, Lenin instituted something known as the New Economic Policy, or this series of five-year plans. Can you tell us about the five-year plans and the part that the major American corporations, major world corporations, played in building up the Soviet Union? Well, there are two separate um, phases here. The, the new, econ new Economic Policy was uh, started in 1923 by Lenin, and I found, and I published this in my first book from Stanford, that every single Russian industry was rebuilt or restarted by foreign corporations, mostly German, British, French, and American. By 1928, uh, Russia was back to approximately its 1913 um, in industrial output. And at that point, uh, she began to think of these grandiose five-year plans. And in 1928, Gosplan, which is the, the uh, Russian Government Planning Commission, actually designed an initial five-year plan. But this was thrown out, it was in inadequate, and American corporations were built in, uh, were, were brought into Russia. And the first five-year plan and the second five-year plan were actually designed in the United States by American corporations. And what were these corporations? Which ones specifically were involved? In the design of the um, first first five-year plan was by a corporation probably not known to most Americans, Albert Kahn. But Albert Kahn was uh, the foremost industrial architect in the United States. And Albert Kahn laid out uh, the, the basics of the first five-year plan for the Soviets. And then we find, again, the same corporations involved with the construction of the plants, International General Electric, most certainly, uh, DuPont, Ford Motor, Hercules Motor, uh, Curtis Wright in aircraft engines, and even some corporations which today were forgotten about, like Valti and uh, Chance Vought. These were aircraft manufacturers at that time. And so American corporations came in and they built the first five-year plan. But what was important, the Soviets had then copied these plans, and this accounts for the tremendous Russian output. They took this initial equipment and they multiplied it, they copied it by the hundred. Now how about Ford Motor Company? Did they play a part in the building up of the Soviet potential? Uh, very definitely. Uh, Ford Motor Company built the Gorky plant and the Gorky plant produces uh, the GAZ series of vehicles, that's GAZ, and these are trucks and there's some automobiles and uh, right from the early 1930s you find that the GAZ plant has had military potential and Ford knew that when it went in and built the Gorky plant. And we know it because I found statements to this effect within the State Department files. Sometimes we hear the name Averill Harriman. Did he play a part in building up the Soviet technology? Uh, very definitely. In fact, Averill Harriman uh, 
came out of the Soviet Union um, financially uh, out of profit, he took over the Georgian manganese concession in the early 1920s. He got this back on his feet for the Soviets, and manganese um, became a prime export for the Soviets, and so they were able to sell this abroad, get foreign exchange, which financed their industrialization. And uh, then they bought out um, Harriman about 1929, and Edel Harriman uh, received this compensation $1 million more than he put in in the first place. How about Armand Hammer of Occidental Petroleum? Armand Hammer is a very interesting example. Um, Armand Hammer received the first foreign concession in 1922 uh, in asbestos in the Ural Mountains. And uh, he also conducted for the Soviets a number of other enterprises, right down to pens and pencil manufacturing, for example. But Armand Hammer is interesting because his father, although Armand Hammer today is chairman of Occidental Petroleum Corporation, his father was Julius Hammer, who in 1919 was Secretary General of the Communist Party USA, which emphasizes the argument I made throughout my books, that at the top level, there's no difference between your top communist and your top capitalist, they're interlinked. You've got Armand Hammer, chairman of Occidental Petroleum, his father was secretary of the Communist Party USA in 1919. So it's basically a power grab. It's a power grab, an international power grab. Now, during the second world... Okay, so this this is really the core of all of this. Is <laughs> This is what I try to bring up as much as possible, but it's difficult to put this across to people who haven't actually looked at the evidence. People who are aware of uh, the operations of secret uh, services within different countries often point out that, for example, the KGB and the CIA and FBI are so closely related that behind closed doors at the top levels, you can't really tell them apart. And that would sound slightly crazy to the most people who aren't involved in those groups. And I'm not involved with those groups, so I can't stand with my hand on my heart and say that's exactly true. But the people who are there and have been in there do say that. And... You know, when you start to listen to this evidence regarding the backgrounds of some of the um, people involved at the top levels of communism, capitalism, and how they're actually basically one of the same people, just like, or, um, or very closely related, just like the way uh, governments tend to be so closely related to corporations, and basically you just have the same people walking in and out from corporation to government, government to corporation, it basically means that as he's saying here, it's a power grab. You know, what we call politics and capitalism, communism, all this stuff, it's basically stage play. It's just theatre on a global level designed to achieve certain goals, which the evidence would suggest, and from what I can see, basically those goals are to keep the people uh, who are operating these groups in a position of power and domination over everyone else. And the majority of people kind of compressed enslaved and too confused to know what to do if they if they think that one particular group is their opponent and you know this other group is causing all their problems they'll be easy to rile up into an army and go and attack them potentially uh, and you've only got to do that twice to have two big armies of people willing to kill each other so as long as people's attention is focused on another country or another racial group or something like that as the cause of their problems they're never going to solve the problems they're only ever going to keep perpetuating this con constant conflict and denial of reality and you know they'll fight to their death over something that wasn't even real meanwhile a very small percentage of the world's population maintain uh the li uh, life style well above you know most kings of the past basically having an unlimited amount of resources to do whatever they want um and most people never even realize that they're the ones causing millions of deaths um, often, you know, people will praise them and call them a hero and so on, whereas, yeah, I mean, they're anything but that. World War, why Russia was pretty well decimated once again by German forces. What part did the American Unleash program play in building up Russia's industrial capacity after the Second World War? Well, Lend Lease built up Russia's capacity, modernized it, and expanded it during World War II. And there was some continuation all the way through perhaps to 1948-1949. There was a program after Land Lease which was supposed to be restricted to foodstuffs and industrial materials, but in effect, uh, I checked the records in the warehouses in Sydney, Maryland, I find that even after World War II, and this was against the intent of Congress, I suspect, there was a massive transfer of the latest industrial equipment to the Soviet Union under the so-called Land Lease program. Now, in 1948, there was a fascinating book came out by Major uh, Racy Jordan, 
in which he talked about American aid to the communists as far as their ability to build nuclear weapons. Did you ever have an opportunity of verifying the facts that we had given them the heavy water, we'd given them the wherewithal to build their atomic weapons? Well, as part of the work I was doing um, at Stanford, I did investigate the, uh, the um, shipping documents for Lend Lease, and I took a sample of these documents and I checked them against Major Jordan. And uh, broadly, uh, Major Jordan was correct within, say, about 5%. And Major Jordan, of course, made the charge that we had shipped materials to the Soviets, 1944 and 1945, which were later used in their atomic program. There is no doubt he is correct. Uh, we shipped heavy water, which is essential. But we shipped other items, which are perhaps less obvious to the layman. We shipped, for example, aluminum tubes. And aluminum tubes are essential for atomic energy development. We shipped graphite, and graphite is another essential component. So generally, as far as I could check, and I checked the original government Lentley's document, General uh, Major Jordan was correct. Now, as the years have gone by, of course, we see a growing Soviet nuclear threat. The Soviets now have MIRV missiles. Mm -hmm. Can you give a little of the background on how the Soviet Union, which really didn't have the technology to develop those MIRV missiles that threaten our cities today, how were they able to develop the MIRV capacity? Well, you've got to go back and look at how the Russians were able to develop a rocket space technology anyway. What they did after World War II was American forces were held back for a while while the Soviets occupied East Germany. They stripped East Germany. They took back the latest of the V-2 rocket technology from Pinamunda and other places. And the V-2 became the basis of the uh, Russian space technology. Now, if you skip the inter 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 intervening years, you will find when you come to the early uh, 1970s that the Russians did not have the capability to MIRV their missiles and in particular they lacked the ability to produce the very precision micro miniature ball bearings that are needed for the control systems there was only one company in the world Brian Chuck and Grinder which could make the machinery which machines the races which within which these ball bearings run and without those races you just cannot make uh, MIRV missiles in any quantity. You can make one off, but not in quantity. Brian Chuck and Grinder was allowed to ship to the Soviet Union 45 of the mach these machines at a time when we only had 33 in the United States. There wasn't there any objection to doing this? I objected. At Miami Beach in 1972, other people objected, but the objections were squashed. And predominantly at fault here was uh, Henry Kissinger and the incoming administration, the incoming and Nixon administration. The, this was no um, I'm sure it was known in DOD. If I knew it, then certainly DOD knew, knew it. But the objections were squashed, and there was, a, uh, there was suppression of the information. And so once again, we see America building up the military capacity, the nuclear threat from the Soviet Union. Well, this goes, you know, when you talk about moving of missiles, you're talking about a quantum jump. In your so... Once again, the repeated theme here, basically, America, elements within the American establishment doing what they can to build up an opponent, basically. Now, why would they do that? First of all, profit. They like their corporations to uh, kill people, basically, is what it comes down to. There's lots of money in that for them. Um, but there's also another very important aspect to this, which is if America has an opponent, then America's people can be held in a state of war and conflict and and fear, basically. And that and people who are frightened are much more easier to control uh, than people who are who are grounded and, and basically thinking for themselves, not in a state of panic. So by keeping the people and the population as frightened as possible, again, the people at the top of the pyramid get to stay there and no one suspects anything, uh, you know, any, no one's any really the, any the wiser that they're the ones behind these opponents. So we, we've seen lots of evidence that America has been funding ISIS. Um, Dr. Uh, not Dr. Major Scott Bennett or Ben A uh, is one whistleblower from the American military who uh, has put forward, he wrote a book and he's been giving many talks on this subject, talking about how the CIA funded ISIS via Swiss banks. Um, there's other evidence from the ground where ISIS has been found with crates of American hardware and so on and American weapons. Um, what can you say? I mean, it's just there's a lot of evidence that this is happening 
And it's amazing to me that America hasn't had a civil war, basically, as a result of all of this stuff. Maybe it's just because people are so frightened of what would happen if they did that. But think of the number of soldiers that, that are involved in this in America who are basically fighting against their own families and they don't even realise it. If they do realise it, what are they going to do, basically? They, they have only really two choices. One is stop fighting and the other is actually take active steps to take back their country from these crooked psychopaths. Um, and that's a challenge to do that, isn't it? Because you've got so many brainwashed people who have no idea any of this is going on, who view any kind of negative commentary, uh, speaking out against the government and so on, as being anti-American. Whereas in reality, when the government themselves are corrupt in that way, it's very pro-American to be against them. Uh, basically, it seems like the only way to avoid total implosion of the whole continent and perhaps the world is basically for the average people let's say uh, in america the majority of people to become aware of history and aware of the real details of what's been hidden from them i'm not sure if there's much else we can do in that regard so this is one of the reasons why i focus on these subjects and uh, why i would really be very happy if more people also did military technology now, I'm not a military man, but to me, the ability to do that is a, um, is a massive leap forward. And we enabled them to do it, and we did it knowingly and deliberately. During the Vietnamese War, the Soviet Union and the Eastern European satellites were the primary suppliers of war materials to the North Vietnamese who were killing American boys in South Vietnam. Would you comment on our aid and trade with the Soviet Union and with the Eastern European satellites during that period of time? Well, there's no question that uh, the Soviets were the prime suppliers of military equipment and supplies to the North Vietnamese. Let me give you an example. Um, the American pilots, as they flew over the Ho Chi Minh Trail, described the trucks that they were seeing as American trucks. Well, they were American trucks because they came from the Gorky plant, and Gorky was built by Henry Ford. And so you have the situation where um, we were, in effect, supplying both sides in the Vietnamese War. But the trucks were being built by the Soviet Union. However, were they getting any materials from the United States to help build those trucks? Yes, um, in the early 1970s. I know specifically of shipments of equipment into the Gorky plant while the war was going on, which in effect were aiding the Soviets to build more trucks to be used by the, by the North Vietnamese. How about loans? Was America extending loans to the Soviet Union during this period when they were the primary financiers of the North Vietnamese? Yes. Uh, beginning about 1970, uh, there was a massive uh, grant of loans to the Soviet Union. I'd say by about 1976, it must have totaled perhaps $40, million, $40 billion outstanding. And so this, of course, these loans were used to enable the Soviet Union to purchase uh, um, industrial equipment in the United States. And this industrial equipment was used to manufacture, in part, military supplies which were used against us in Vietnam. How about Russian shipping that was being used to ferry supplies to North Vietnam? Mm -hmm. Shipping is a very interesting example because the Soviets published a shipping register about uh, 6,000 ships. And I analyzed every one of these ships, so both the origin of the technology of the ship itself, the hull, and the engine. Most of them are marine diesel engines. And I find that 60% of the Soviet uh, merchant marine, which of course has military usefulness, 60% was built aboard. Only 40% in the Soviet Union, and that largely to Western design. But when you come to marine diesel engines, you find something really fascinating. You find that 80% of the marine diesel engines in Soviet merchant ships are Western engines, uh, Burmeister and Wayne of Copenhagen, Copenhagen Sulzer of Switzerland, Fiat of Italy, because that name has come up before. But the other 20% of marine diesel engines built in the Soviet Union are built to Western design under technical assistance contracts from Sulzer and uh, Burmeister and Wayne. So in effect, there could be no Soviet merchant marine without assistance from the West. How about the building of the Kama River plant? Kama River was built in the late 1960s, early 1970s. The basic design, the contract was let to the um, Italian firm of Fiat, uh, Giovanni Agnelli as the chairman of the board. And uh, this is important because Agnelli is tied in with Chase Manhattan Bank. He's on the uh, International Advisor Committee at Chase Manhattan. Uh, what caught my attention was that Fiat does not manufacture automobile manufacturing equipment. All the Fiat plants in Italy are contain American equipment. 
And what I found was that the equipment was coming, perhaps about 60-70% of it, from the United States, from major automobile equipment suppliers in the United States. I think the, it was known as the Fiat plant as a cover um, to perhaps divert attention from the fact that during the Vietnamese War, we were building the largest plant in the world. It covers 36 square miles. We were building for the Soviets with American equipment, the largest plant in the world. And so it's called the Italian Fiat plant, and I think this was a blind. And so they were building their trucks and armored personnel carriers and other things that could be used then for warfare in South Vietnam? We knew that the Karma plant had military potential. In 1972, I wrote it in National Suicide. In, um, I said as much in Miami Beach in 1972. This plant has military potential. It can produce military vehicles. We knew it. And, of course, today in Afghanistan, we find that the Karma vehicles that are, are there in Afghanistan today from the Karma plant built by American and Italian companies. And it was after you brought out this information that efforts were made to suppress your book, National Suicide, yes. and your other studies? Yes, because I was bringing out the fact that the Karma River plant had military potential, that we were moving the missiles with the Bryant uh, chucking grinder equipment, and, of course, other facts along these lines. And what sort of pressure was brought to bear upon you? What sort of pressure was brought to bear upon the publisher of your book, National Suicide? Uh, the, uh, there was pressure on the publisher uh, to prevent publication, to stop publication. Uh, he refused to do so. There's pressure brought upon me first to withdraw the book, and then a rather um, deceitful sort of pressure. It was claimed at the Hoover Institution that I had uh, plagiarized Volume 3 of my Western Technology series, which was being published by Stanford University. Well, firstly, I challenged them to point out the plagiarization, and nobody could find even two sentences that matched up. But then I pointed out that I cannot plagiarize my own work. I hold the copyright on both books, and no way in the world can I plagiarize myself. That's a logical impossibility. And then, gradually, it built up over the following years uh, that my research was uh, perhaps going a little out of what was... Um, perhaps required or welcome would be a better word and it should be confined within more narrow uh, boundaries and at that point in 1975 i left the hoover institution and since then i've become uh, an independent author and i can publish what i want to publish do you know of any other instances where efforts were made to suppress publication of books through the hoover institute i know one example uh, one i was personally aware of and that uh, was Julius Epstein's book on Operation Kukol, which is a very important book uh, on the treatment of Russian prisoners of war in Germany after World War II. This book was in manuscript for several years, and he was not allowed to publish it. I, I heard that firsthand from Julius. Right, and eventually it was, of course, brought out. It was at, um, at a, uh, a later point. Now, another example I can give is my own um, Western Technology series. The third volume of that was held in galleys for one year. Now, it costs a lot of money to hold a book in galleys, because when a book is in galleys, you want to get out on the market to start recouping your investment. That book was held in galleys for one year, because it was not politically um, wise or acceptable to publish it at that time, even though it was an academic book. Now, you've done some fascinating studies on the Trilateral Commission. Can you tell us about the Trilateral Commission? The Trilateral Commission um, is a private organization founded by David Rockefeller in 1973. It was essentially financed by um, Rockefeller and some of the foundations, Kettering Foundation, Danforth Foundation, Ford Foundation. Uh, Ford Foundation is a very major contributor. And uh, the uh, stated objective is to encourage discussion amongst what they call the trilateral regions. I should point out that of the 300 members, one-third come from the United States, one-third from Japan, and one-third from Europe. But in effect, I find that the actions of the Trilateral Commission are very much self-interested on the part of the international banking community in New York. Now, as far as the Trilateral Commission's influence on the American government is concerned, it's been said that the, there is a very excessive representation of the Trilateral Commission in Jimmy Carter's cabinet and in Jimmy Carter's administration. Well, excessive is rather um, an understatement, I think. There's some 200 million people in the United States. There are only 77 Trilateral members who are American. Out of that 77, I counted no fewer than 18 Trilateralists. That's about one-third of the Trilateral 
American trilateral contingent turns up in the Carter administration. Mr. Carter himself is a trilateral, Mr. Mondale, Mr. Brown, Mr. Vance, Mr. Blumenthal, Mr. Brown, Secretary of Defense. In other words, they occupy all the senior cabinet and sub-cabinet posts. In fact, there's some key committees, intelligence and defense committees, which are only comprised of trilaterals. So here you've got 77 Americans selected by one man, David Rockefeller, who's chairman of Chase Manhattan Bank, and we find that they turn up in the key controlling positions in Washington under the Carter administration. And would this suggest to you that perhaps we do not select the uh, government, that it is selected by these people who work behind the scenes? You can come to no other conclusion. So, you know, this is something that many people have commented on and have really known for a long time. Uh, this is just another angle on this, more evidence from the past that, yes, basically, the the governments of the world, particularly America and probably most other countries, to be honest, but let's just focus on America, that particular government um, is not created as a result of an election or as any kind of genuine representation of the people, which should be obvious to anybody paying attention, but here you've got really good evidence um, an insight into who is really calling the shots, how it's done, and what they're doing with with that power. So, ultimately, in this example, you've got you know a power monger, World Bank owning character in the form of the Rockefeller family. Let's say as it is now, it's not just one person, but um, literally picking a hierarchy who then go on to form the majority of the powerful positions in the government. So. Um, you know, I know f myself that that is more or less what happens in, in Britain and other countries as well. Um, and the rest of the actual politics, the, all the mass media, all the newspaper stuff, all of the sort of so-called debates that happen, it's all just stage theatre. Nearly all of it is stage theatre, no matter how extreme the different teams and political parties seem to be against each other in terms of their opposition. Um, ultimately, they're just playing out and fulfilling a role designed to make it look like uh, they actually, you know, have some say over the policies that are put forward through the government. In reality, the policies are going to be put forward no matter what happens in politics, and this is one of the reasons why no matter which political party or leader gets in, the policies don't ever really seem to change all that much, basically. If you look today at who's running for office, you find Mr. Bush is a trilateral, you find Mr. Anderson is a trilateral, Mr. Carter is a trilateral. We find articles appearing in Newsweek magazine, Time magazine, U.S. News and World Report, many of the major media telling us there's really nothing to be concerned about from the Trilateral Commission. Is there any interlock between the Trilateral Commission and the major media in the United States? Yes, there is an interlock, um, particularly in the um, news media, for example, the uh, Chicago Sun-Times, the executive editor there, uh, James Hoogie is uh, a trilateral. You'll find uh, Sol Linowitz is a director of Time magazine. And I think, yes, um, Schacht, uh, Henry Schacht is a director of CBS. So there very definitely is an interlock between the trilaterals and the media. And perhaps this is the reason then that they rather play down the influence of the Trilateral Commission on contemporary American government. Yes, I had a computer survey made of um, all articles that have been printed on the Trilateral Commission since 1973, I could find worldwide only 73 articles. Now, what's the relationship between the Trilateral Commission and the Council on Foreign Relations? Uh, well, of course, the Council on Foreign Relations is a much older organization founded in 1920. I did a study in which I compared uh, trilaterals with or without membership in the CFR, Council on Foreign Relations. I find there's something over 50% overlap. Okay, so that's the end there. Um, wow, what can we say? I mean, there's so many different avenues that I could go down uh, when it comes to this subject. And, you know, we could talk about how Nazi German scientists were basically taken to America through Operation Paperclip at the end of World War II and apparently took over NASA. And, you know, there's a very clear um, connection between power mongers and elites, let's say, in America and the Nazi ideology. And I would say that largely that has continued to the present day. So, yeah, um, definitely lots of food for thought there. Definitely recommend reading Anthony Sutton's books and other books related to that, um, related to the topics here. If you want to know more about this and 
Uh, what can I say? Literally, you could spend five years researching all this and still only touch the surface of it. But there are certain key things to understand, which hopefully you've you've been able to gain from this this video, with regards to who you're really looking at and listening to when you turn on the news and see these various politicians and corporate agents making their claims. Um, you know, ultimately, public relations is is the name of the game, and they're you know, public PR people often are paid a huge amount of money to make people who really are quite unpleasant seem to be nice and friendly. So uh, I'll leave this here. It's gone on long enough, but I look forward to reading your comments. And uh, yeah, do let us know what you think about all this. And please do like, upvote, share, reblog, whatever it is you need to do on the social media channel you are watching this on to get more eyeballs on this because it would really help us all if we uh, all figured this stuff out. So until next time, anyway, peace to all and uh, I'll see you soon. Cheers.